So hello and welcome to everyone. Uh, we're delighted you're here to join us for our final installment of our 2022 webinar series, which has been titled The Possibilities and Practicalities of Cloud Adoption in Life Sciences. So my name is Pauline O'Riordan and I am Head of Strategy and Product here at Odyssey BC. Uh, I'll be your host today um, for the part four, uh, our final part, and the title of, of today's session is Agile Development Methodology that Satisfies Regulatory Requirements. Uh, in today's webinar, we will be exploring how an agile approach to software development presents an opportunity to revise the traditional dependency on approved documentation as the output to demonstrate validation, um, validation and consideration that agile development artifacts, as, as we call them, and can provide the traceability and the verification. So we have a fabulous panel joining us and um, we'd like to welcome Mr. Finan Friel. Uh, Finan is Head of Business Solutions and Co-Founder at Odyssey VC. I have to make apologies for Mr. Oshin Kern, uh, who is CEO and Co-Founder of Odyssey VC. He cannot uh, join the webinar today, unfortunately. But a warm welcome to Mr. Mark Healy. Uh, Mark is Head of Technology at Odyssey VC. And then there's myself. What does the agenda look like today? I will start with a small presentation, just looking over, uh, I suppose, the adaption of vertical SaaS, as we'll call it, in life sciences. And um, this will be followed by a presentation by Mark. Um, Mark will take a deep dive into looking at leveraging DevOps to streamline compliance. And then finally, as always, we will round off with the panel discussions where Mark and I will be joined by, by Finan. So, um, Please submit your questions uh, at any point uh, throughout the session, and we, we'd love to get them, and then we can just go through them in a panel discussion, and we'll get to as many as we can um, during, during our session today. Uh, as always, please feel free to post about our event uh, on social media using the hashtags, hashtags OVC webinar uh, and our hashtag Odyssey VC. Uh, and as always, please make sure to follow us uh, on social media platforms. OK, so let's get started then. So I will take a moment to um, I might just check in with Finan and Mark to make sure you guys are online before I kick off just to do a quick audio and uh, video check if that's okay. I'm Pauline can you hear me? Hi hey, Pauline. Yes great guys thanks so much and um, so that's grand so I'll pop in and, and kick off proceedings with the first uh, presentation. Okay so where are we going to start? So the theme of our webinar series this year has been all about uh, how we can support the adoption of cloud technology in our industry. So without doubt, life sciences companies are seeing and understanding more and more uh, about the benefits of using cloud as a foundation for digital transformation. And it's not just about running a more streamlined business or lowering costs or uh, scaling on demand, but more about embracing new ways of working, uh, the ability to uh, unlock data, collaborate across ecosystems, and ultimately create more meaningful products and medicines uh, that will improve patient outcomes. The use of software as a service or SaaS applications is, is definitely growing within life sciences. Um, currently, the strongest adoption of SaaS application uh, within life sciences is in the area of what we call horizontal SaaS, uh, solutions from providers that service more general business functions, for example, sales or finance or HR. Um, and these horizontal SaaS um, solutions have drastically modernized how, how these functions operate. However, there is a trend now towards uh, what known as vertical SaaS. So SaaS applications designed to solve specific industry pain points. Uh, and this adoption is, is accelerating. And why? Because um, these SaaS, uh, vertical SaaS providers are not interested in being all things to all customers. They're really concentrating on, on the best solution for, for their uh, customers in their industry. So this brings clear uh, benefits for uh, the customer and clear opportunities for the providers of vertical SaaS into the life science industry. But of course, delivering into the life science industry uh, does not come without uh, its, its challenges. Look at that. 
So if you're a vertical SaaS provider and your target customer is a life sciences customer, it is likely that your application is going to be handling regulated data. So there will be an expectation that the application you provide is, can be, is validated and can be audited. And the infrastructure on which your application resides also needs to be qualified um, and audited. And uh, why? Because your customer, the life science customers, has to ensure this in order to satisfy the international regulatory bodies uh, and ultimately uh, produce you know, product or look after product quality and in the end, patient safety. So that's why it's important. So this does provide one of the biggest challenges for the vertical SaaS companies to want to go into uh, the life sciences industry. Um, because more and more regulated customers are the life science customers. They're, they're pushing the responsibility of the validation and the qualification onto the SaaS providers, or at least they're, they're looking to leverage what the SaaS providers are doing in order to support the, the compliance activities. So, as I said, there is a clear shifting of expectations towards the SaaS provider. Um, I really like this illustration. I've taken it from um, an article in the November, December 2021 uh, I, uh, ISPA Pharmaceutical Engineering Industry Magazine, but it just clearly shows a shift in the control of the activities that feed, feed into demonstrating the compliance of a regulated software application. So many of the activities have shifted from the life sciences company to the SaaS provider. Um, and the life science companies are going to rely on the, the SaaS provider for ensuring these activities are carried out in compliance with the regulations. So activities that would formerly have been with the end user or the life science company would be infrastructure quality control or uh, configuration and elements of uh, system validation. They're now pushed on um, uh, to the, the SaaS provider. Now, of course, I have to point out that it's important to note that the ultimate uh, responsibility for the validation for intended use and compliant operation of the SaaS application still resides with the regulated life science company, but they will be looking to, for the support of the SaaS provider to, to support them in, in this. So while the expectations are shifting, um, there's no need for the SaaS providers to feel pressure because as a SaaS uh, company or provider, it's likely that you already have good practices um, in place that can be leveraged. So um, what needs to happen really is the SaaS provider just needs to familiarize themselves with life sciences terminology so that they can explain um, how what they do meets the regulatory requirements of their customers. Um, and they should pay attention to this. So, so pay attention to the ability to translate and explain your controls and good practices. Uh, for towards your regulated customer. Um, what can help here significantly is, uh, is a robust quality management system um, to support the SaaS company demonstrate the controls and good practices. Actually, we spoke a lot about this in part two of our webinar series this year. So an efficient quality management system, uh, maybe in tandem with um, some international standard certifications and regular audits, really allows the SaaS provider, you know, demonstrate a consistency in their product quality development processes and um, that would satisfy regulated customers. Um, in fact, the evidence of a robust quality management system uh, by a provider, by a SaaS provider, can often be a fundamental part of a regulated customer's selection process. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to touch on the point that, you know, it's known that most SaaS providers um, use an agile approach to software development to facilitate the rapid deployment of high quality software. The industry and the industry regulators have recognized this evolution in software development practices and um, away far from the, the linear sequential or waterfall development uh, methodologies to nonlinear and agile uh, methodologies and they have responded to be fair to them they've responded so the recognition of agile software development practices has been called out in new and updated publications of the GAMP 5 guidelines and the new FDA draft CSA guidelines so significantly the new guidelines emphasize of the use of critical thinking 
And they point to a shift in the need for traditional documents like IQs, OQs and PQs to risk based records of information held in appropriate systems. So the new guidelines offer huge support for SaaS solutions to be successfully adopted into life sciences. But it's critical for SaaS providers to recognize the, the key role they play in this success. So the SaaS provider really must ensure that their development and, and maintenance artifacts demonstrate the acceptable evidence, about the evidence to comply with the expectations of, of their regulated customers. So that is like leads nicely into really the deep dive that Mark is going to look at and, and a way in which you can, you know, do this. So that's that's me um, for now. So just to give a little bit of an introduction to uh, really the, the core of our of our um, webinar today. So, Mark, I'm going to if you're ready to maybe share your camera and, and come online, then I will uh, share your presentation. You'll have it ready to go. Thanks, Bonnie. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Okay, Thanks, yeah, we can Mark. hop on to the next. Thanks, Pauline. We can go on to the next slide straight away if you want. So yeah, we're really sure. going to build on what Pauline mentioned and just see how these, um, how contemporary practices like DevOps and agile development can really help streamline and, and um, integrate compliance into software development. So over the past maybe 20 years, there's been a lot of work done in terms of improving software development practices. Um, Increasing the, the agility of software development. So how can we get new features into the market faster? How can we decrease that time to market? Um, looking at the cost and effort associated with maintaining software in production um, and making software more reliable and more highly available. Um, but with all those improvements, validation is always seen almost as like an afterthought. So you do your software uh, under an agile framework, you get it ready for production, then you start to validate it as a completely separate activity afterwards. And what we want to do is see how we can get the best of both worlds. How can we take um, this agile, adaptive, flexible development process, but also produce software that's safe and validated and, and fit for purpose? So on the next slide, we can kind of look at how they currently align. So at the moment, um, they actually do very similar things. So agile development and, compl and compliance have the same sort of focus areas. They have defined processes. They're looking to make sure that software is fit for purpose, that it works properly, that it's properly tested and, and, and fit for purpose, but they do it for very different reasons. So if you take the, the graph on the side and starting off at the, the bottom left, where we have a kind of a non-validated, non-compliant piece of software, if we wanna bring that into an agile development process, we're looking to make it more scalable. We're looking at more scalable processes. Um, make the work repeatable, adaptable, uh, structured properly so that we know exactly what's going to happen. Um, we know that it's, if we have one team, we scale to 10 or 15 or 20 teams, the same processes will be followed, the same steps will be done. And from a validation and compliance perspective, we're looking at making sure the software is, you know, it's well, the functionality is well-defined and operates as expected, that the software is dependable, that changes and, and releases are controlled. And it's it's almost like we're, do, we're, we're working tangentially in the sense that we're, we're doing very similar thing, but for very different purposes. And the goal of this, what we call compliant DevOps on the next slide is to really see, is there a way that we can combine these two mindsets and work to a common focus where we go from, again, from the bottom left, where you've got a, non-compliant or, or, or uh, non-validated piece of software in a waterfall situation where we can take that, make it adaptable, make it agile, make it um, easy and cost-effective to maintain, but also make it compliant. And really, the benefits that we talked about on the previous slide, they apply in any industry. So it's not just something that's going to benefit life sciences. Everybody wants their software to be, you know, function as, as expected, to, to fit for purpose, reliable, and so on. And it's also independent method, methodology. We don't say you need to use, say, Scrum versus Kanban. Again, regardless of the industry you're in, the type of software you're building, the approach you take to developing that software, you want these kind of benefits. 
And what we focused on really is the automation and tooling that associate, that's associated with DevOps. Now I'll go into DevOps in a bit more detail later, but really we're talking about what we call CICD pipelines. These are structured automated processes that happen after a developer writes some code. So it's things like automated testing, automated deployment, um, and it's a very clearly defined, repeatable, and dependable process. So regardless of which developer writes the code, regardless of which team they're on, regardless of how many other people are involved in the project as well, the same process is followed every time. Uh, there's a heavy reliance on automated testing, uh, which is a key part of this because quite often in software, we, we will change one piece of functionality or we'll add in a new feature and that causes an unexpected failure somewhere else in the software. With automated testing, we test all the entire application all of the time. So every change, we test everything, not just the, the, the feature that's under the focus of the, the change. This allows us to make software in a very confident and adaptable fashion. So we can make software that we can change very quickly, we can change in a safe and controlled manner. And also there's a huge amount of auditing and logging information being gathered throughout that process. So every test that's executed, we have test results for that. Every you know temporary environment that we deploy, we've got the full specifications for that. So we have everything that we need to do everything that we need. And before I go further into that, if we go on to the next slide, we can talk very briefly about what DevOps typically means. So there's a lot of different, different definitions of DevOps, but for me, the simplest way of looking at it is it's automating everything that happens after a developer writes some code. So again, doesn't matter if it's a single developer or a huge number of teams working on a product, somebody writes some code, that code gets pushed into the, the, the repository or the source control for the, for the code, and a number of steps happen. So these steps are designed to make sure that there are no adverse side effects of that code change, that there are no regressions being caused in the system, that um, the system is being properly built and tested before it's being deployed. Traditionally, in a waterfall environment where you don't have other things like infrastructure as code and, and things like that, you would have to go through a huge process where you would write the code, you'd go onto your IT operations team and say, okay, can you build an environment and deploy this code into it? That would take a for anything from hours to days or even weeks to get that done. Then you'd have your testers go in and start running manual tests against it. And that process gets executed over any number of, any time frame from days to even months in some cases. Once that's done and it's, it's formally signed off on, you repeat that again in your next environment, maybe a pre-production environment. So it's a very long drawn out process. With DevOps, it's done, number one, automatically, and two, very, very quickly, but probably most importantly, it's done consistently. So regardless of who made the change, the same tests are being run the same way to the same standard. And that's really the key focus of, of DevOps is to make sure that we have that consistent execution of all these steps. So where Compliant DevOps changes that or, or adds to that on the next slide is we've looked at the compliance needs and how they can fit around or wrap around a standard DevOps process. So a key part of that is what we call the three amigo alignments. So the three amigos are your product development team who would typically write your requirements, your developers who do the development and your testers who make sure everything functions as expected. And to, to get that alignment, we, we tend to rely on a, a, well, ideally we rely on what we call BDD or behavior driven development. This is where you build a common language across those three functions where everybody understands what the scope of each feature is or each requirement is, how it's expected to work, what it's expected to do. And you avoid the situation where things are misinterpreted or um, maybe requirements are a little bit subjective or unclear and people build the wrong thing or they test the wrong thing. Um, so as I said, mentioned before, DevOps processes give us this kind of full traceability and auditability. So for each of those steps in the process, we can see exactly what's happening. We can see the output of each step. The key to compliant DevOps is two things. First of all, get the requirements in a format, again, ideally BDD format or test-driven development format, where we can kind of see exactly what the scope of those requirements are. Run the, the and link those to the, the code that we're developing. As we run each step, we collect evidence. And after the first step, that what's called the CI step, which is where we take a, a, a code change, 
run a suite of automated tests and ensure that everything works as expected, we can have an approval process, which we can obviously reject or, or approve. And then that leads us on to a delivery into a target environment where we can do verification. So we're not necessarily changing DevOps, but we're structuring it in such a way that the evidence that we need for compliance is gathered as part of a standard development process. We're not developing and then taking a step back and starting compliance afterwards. They're both fully aligned and, and, and integrated with each other. And when we take those two, those two concepts and put them together like that, uh, we start to see some really significant benefits. So on the next slide, we, we can look at the differences, the traditional differences between DevOps and, and um, software compliance and validation. When we talk about DevOps, we talk about Agile, we talk about failing fast. So try things, if it doesn't work, that's fine. Fix it in the next sprint. It's short, iterative cycles, limited documentation. It's not very controlled, it's not very structured. It's not always clear exactly what's being done and if it's gonna work. That's probably underselling it, but it, it's designed to get value into the product as quickly as possible. There's a risk of failure and that's typically accepted because Again, you're not waiting for an extracted or a, an extended release cycle to get the feature or to the fix into production. You can literally do that almost straight away. So we deal with failure almost retrospectively. Ideally, we have enough testing in place that failures don't occur or don't go unnoticed. But if it's a case that we do introduce failures or regressions into the software, we deal with that in the next sprint. We don't panic, we don't kind of revert. And Typically with compliance validation, we want a lot more control up front. We want to make sure that everything's working as expected before it gets anywhere near production. With compliant DevOps, we, we can take these two very different views of how software should be developed and controlled, and we align them. So we have a, a tightly controlled, clearly understood process because we have those requirements up front. Um, we've automated testing to make sure that any change has zero impact on any part of the system and that the system continues to operate as expected. There's very little manual intervention. So again, without automated testing, DevOps doesn't really have much value because you've, you've now got to go into these manual test cycles and that takes longer and it costs more money. So a key part of DevOps is automated testing. A key part of, of validation is testing to make sure it functions as required. Um, we also get the benefit that we can move from procedural or, or process-based controls into system level workflows. So the system, the pipelines that we've built define how the, the process is controlled. They define what information is gathered, what checks are in place. It's clearly auditable. It's, it's, it's executed in the same fashion every time. Um, so there's no human error element or very limited uh, scope for human error. And uh, the, the evidence moves from a sort of huge singular effort to an ongoing, almost real-time data collection uh, process. So rather than saying, okay, we've built the software, now we go and test the software and, and, and validate it, and now we produce the evidence based on that validation. Every time the code has changed, we're rerunning all these pipelines, we're regathering all this evidence, we're recompiling the evidence, and we're producing um, point in time information or very current information about how the system's performing from a, a, a functional perspective from in terms of performance and availability and so on and so on. And we, we avoid a situation where documentation gets out of sync because the documentation is part of the process, um, whether that's the requirements or it's the evidence of, of test execution. Everything in that pipeline is a part of the process. And, define, and, and the process is defined by all those parts. So we're no longer trying to keep different, you know, multiple documents like requirement specifications, uh, IQs and OQs and all these things in, in sync. It's literally done as part of this process. And that's, to me, that's probably the most important benefit of what we're doing here is that we have data-driven processes that produce the evidence that we need when we need it. And uh, I can leave it there, and I think that's probably a good time to go into the Q&A sessions because I see there are a few questions coming through already. Thanks a million, Mark. I mean, and 
you know, as I said earlier on in my presentation as well, to tie in with this, you know, the regulatory bodies and, and the guidelines now are really supporting this message that you've just really gone into detail there you know the idea that you know with the traditional need to have everything documented can now be looked at and saying well what artifacts represent the evidence and so building it in to your you know development process on a day-to-day -day, as, as you say so that, yeah. that's really great thanks so much um yeah thank you so let me just uh i suppose uh just invite maybe Finan back into um, our group, if that's okay, Finan, thanks so much. You can turn on your camera. Brilliant. Yep. Thank hey, Finan. Yeah, so there are questions coming through. That's great. And just to say to everybody, please, on online, please feed through your questions as they come to you. So let me start with the first one that I see come through. It says, um, will compliant DevOps introduce a lot of overhead into my existing DevOps framework? So I suppose kind of touched on that, but maybe Mark. Yeah, know. I think it's, I want to give a good answer. The, the short yeah. bad answer is it depends on your your, your, your framework, but ideally yeah. if you if you trust your framework, if you rely on your framework to do automated testing and you, you can kind of stand by that testing and know that, okay, I don't need to manually test this. I'm, I'm satisfied with the level of testing we have in place. Then it's a simple shift because you're kind of building around that. If you're, Framework is less mature than that, and it's just okay. We'll we'll do a few simple tests, maybe smoke tests or whatever it is. Then, really, what you've got to do, and and maybe on that 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 second or third side where we had the two kind of tangential yeah. focuses, I think if you if you have a mature DevOps process with full scope of testing, then it's an easy adaptation of that yeah. rather than a huge reworking of it because. Um, the testing is going to produce evidence. It's how we gather that evidence. And maybe what we've seen in the past with other clients is that we have to maybe make the test scripts more verbose. So as they run, that we're producing more output, which helps kind of yeah. um, provide more evidence. But generally speaking, if you've, if you've got good DevOps processes, you're a long way along this path. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, picking up on, on the next question, I'll just go through, through them se sequentially. Uh, with this move towards uh, compliance of cloud technology and cloud activities, will there be a need for the traditional separate roles of IT and compliance start to merge? Will there be a need or will the, I suppose, the two separate roles merge? Maybe Finan, you could comment on that, sure. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, look, at I suppose if you look at the history of um, kind of validation within life science companies, they're... The, uh, the IT department, if you look at it in terms of kind of a football match, they were kind of always on the sidelines. Um, <laughs> but over time now, they're starting to get, having to come onto the pitch to play, you know, uh, that's the way I see it for IT. Even um, even with the transition from, it, it was happening already, so um, uh, it's going to have to happen a bit more. Yeah, they, the um, the IT people are 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 and going to have to continue to be more uh, compliance aware, compliance savvy, um, and ensure that what they do, um, you know, doesn't Im impact the system, especially around um, yeah. change control to be a, a big one as well for IT traditionally, you know, um, and it's one of the one of the things that it's, it, there's a lot of findings in, or there were a lot of findings in audits around why do some things go through your ticketing system and some things go through your change control system? That's one of the things that you, as part of this, that you'd need to be firm on. And it's okay for things to go down each route, yeah. but um, you need to have good definition around uh, what goes each way um, as well. But um, I don't know, does that answer the question, Pauline? Or is that... Um, yeah, no, very... Do you, do you see a dual role or do you see just actually the IT people taking more or let's say, let's say building their knowledge on QA and the QA building on IT and that the roles will still have defined you know it's very specific I suppose uh, roles within the organization uh, sep very separate yeah. as in but uh, taking more of an interest so you don't think it'll be combined role or I don't know just uh, there probably will be a kind of an interface role so like an IT yeah. compliance person that sits in the right. middle yes of, yes would drive the behaviors of the teams below them or even the IT department but um, again like you know like it needs to be procedurally controlled and people trained to it you know that's kind of that's kind of um, the best way to control and manage it you know perfect thanks thanks Finan okay um 
we are coming up against a lot of skepticism or resistance for some of our farmer clients and, pro uh, and prospects when we are trying to introduce new technologies, especially cloud. Any advice? Is that a software provider or an infrastructure? So, yeah, I'm company? assuming it's a software provider because it says oh. introducing new talent, especially around our cloud and SaaS products. Sorry. So any advice? So I assume it's a SaaS provider. Yes. Okay. Uh, I might just jump in there quickly, I suppose, Pauline. Um, yeah. One of the requirements for a life science company to use anybody is a supplier audit. Um, just one second. <laughs> No problem. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, one of the requirements for um for anybody to use you, particularly in life science and in, in business, but even more so in life science, is that they have to do a supplier assessment of you in order to accept right. you, right? Part of that, and as part of due diligence, they also have to confirm that you, in turn, do supplier assessments and that you have assessed any sub supplier that it's going to be involved in the okay. life science offering that you give um i can see that that's a requirement that they have to do and it, it boils down to the point that you can outsource activities you can you can get people to help you get good vendors to help you but you cannot outsource your regulatory requirements in other words so the requirement that infrastructure must be qualified you can get qualified infrastructure of somebody else but you cannot say oh we just got this infrastructure it's up to those guys to qualify it or, you know, that's okay. not how you can outsource it. So I, I can see where where that might be the case and why people are maybe getting. Um, OK, um, that, but I think go ahead, Paul. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, I think that that makes sense to me. It's, they're kind of saying, I suppose it's about a responsibility chain. You know, is the, the life science companies are responsible for making sure the supplier that they intend using is yeah. you know fully audited. But in turn, if you're yeah. a SaaS provider into life sciences, you Correct. have to make sure everyone feeding into you yeah. is also you know following the the right control yeah. or has the right controls and following the right procedures. To... Exactly. Plus, the more compliant you're offering, the, the easier the questions will be. Like the, you, you yes. get a questionnaire from let's say, so if you have ISO nine thousand and one or twenty seven thousand one, if you operate in a quality management system and you can demonstrate that including yes. your sub suppliers all those questions are answered quicker if you don't have any of those doesn't mean that they won't use it, it just makes the it makes the the questionnaire that that supplier a bit harder to get through it involves putting much more into your service level agreements and your contracts to get to make the offering compliant and yeah. um, if you don't do it well then the um the the, the company themselves have to do it and that's more effort and it makes you less appealing to yes. the to potentially the persons that you're or the the other company that you're up against to win this contract you know so it's all about making yourself um attractive uh yeah and it's easy to use i suppose i can see that i can see that like if you're a regulation customer and you're dealing with you know a SaaS provider and the resistance would be if you feel that that SaaS provider does not understand uh, or one understand the need for it and two you know have them have them in place so i suppose as, as we were talking about even earlier on in this session you know the in order for you to be successful, you've got to understand your regulated customers' regulated or regulatory requirements and, and yeah. support them. Thanks, Finan. Um, okay, so uh, this one we struggle to get our DevOps teams to even consider compliance. Okay, quick uh, release cycles and software quality always takes priority, and compliance is very much an afterthought. Any advice of examples of how to change this kind of thinking? Mark, maybe you want yeah. to... But there's a very there's a very relevant word in there where they said software quality because compliance is also about quality. And I think it's about understanding the the kind of the shared need of both uh, sides of the house. Nobody wants to produce bad software. Um, and it's really about the the compliant DevOps process allows you to bring quality with a capital Q into your process much earlier on, and it's it's it suits nobody to have a a, a a standard DevOps process that's followed by a standard compliance process because you get the you get the worst of both, both worlds. You've got your compliance team literally running around every couple of weeks trying to get the next version of it. Um, uh, validated you've got your development team who are trying to ship features quickly and they've got to wait for the compliance piece to finish so it's really about getting 
alignment on the requirements early on. Um, it's about making sure that you're testing. It goes back to that kind of DevOps maturity. If your DevOps testing is a is at a level where everyone's comfortable with it, so right. you you can go to your 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 compliance team, your quality people, and say, look. Here's all the tests that we're running. Here's the the execution results from the last test that we <coughs> wrote. You can see the scope of it. It's about getting that kind of engagement as early in the process as, as possible. Because again, one of the, the key things about DevOps is you're trying to streamline what's happening after you write code. And a big part of what happens after you write code is getting that validated and compliant. Yes. So um not sure if that's answering the question yeah um, no, but one, yeah. one point you made earlier as well mark was is 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 you have your devops process your, your compliant devops process it, it's all about keeping it an automated process not jumping out into paper based here yep. or there and providing evidence that's that's that i think is a key answer to that question that's been asked is to and that's where the devops traditional devops it people might say uh oh, that, where that might annoy them and say but if you yep. make those few adjustments because as mark said it's already in there it's yeah. about adding a little bit to make make the evidence more uh, evident to the people that want to see it and uh and not not yeah. not add manual processes to to it it's all about structuring it correctly so it stays automated but with that bit more provision of evidence and a little bit more compliance around it but i can see if you wanted to jump out and say oh you need to fill in this form now and yeah. paper based here and send on a cycle and stop until i get some quality approval on it you know that's the kind of thing that might annoy people but um yes Keep it automated and as Mark said, explain it to quality. The quality people or other departments say this is how it's done and here's why it's so good. That's yep. uh, because yeah. that's what Mark did for me. And I couldn't believe how good it was. Like it's about eliminating humans out of the process too a bit. So this uh, BDD that Mark talks about, it's um and verbose yeah. testing scripts. Um it's really, really good when it, when you demonstrated that to a person that's coming from more traditional and they can see the quality that delivers you say you're taking the person out of it uh, which is where a lot of the mistakes can be so this is um it's about telling the right story you know yep. yeah great great thanks very much and um, we'll take the last couple of, of questions here so i don't know if there's a question or a statement but I'm, i'll read it i'll read it slowly it's from Raphael. and um, hi on putting it on the putting it all together slide one thing that improves the connection between control validation and speed devops uh, is the addition of cross-functional risk assessment on the user story and acceptance criteria level during the formation of the sprint backlog. By identifying the actual risks with your QA, CSV, IT and BO, uh, you can create focus testing that will give you enough control over the implementation. This also aligns with the CSA guidelines uh, guidance given by the FDA recently. So risk yeah. assessment would be a good addition to speed uh, even more your processes. So yeah, um, yeah that's, that's more a statement than a question. Yeah, it's more a statement than a question. Yeah, he's, well he's, on the ball, yeah. he's on the ball there. Yeah. And I meant to I meant to say that at the very start that for the first time uh, since um, it, it, you know we've, we've been waiting a long time, but for the first time yeah. ever, um, CSA and GAMP uh, second edition has come out using this language. Yes, you know, um, DevOps, agile approaches, um, less restrictive testing, undocumented testing to get to a point where you know that the software is going to work and provide a good outcome for the product and the patient. That's, but um, yeah. that's what I meant to say at the start. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's great. Great. Thanks, Raphael. Yeah. Spot on in the statement. And let's just, uh, I suppose, wrap up. We'll take the final question and uh, we can probably wrap up then. So, um, Life science companies are an important target for us, okay, but we are also targeting other industries that are not as concerned with compliance, okay. Are there any obvious benefits outside of the regulatory compliance that we could use for those other industries? It's an interesting question. I think Mark, uh, you touch I can it. jump in there, yeah. I think, yeah. Um, again, I suppose one of, one of the key focuses of this is to minimize the effort required to make software compliant because you're already testing as part of your, your DevOps process anyway. And as I said on one of the slides, regardless of the industry you're in, regardless of the, the methodologies that you use, you want the same things from your software. You want it to be adaptable yeah. and, 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 and low risk and low cost to, to ex extend or, or change. So um, when I, I've been on IT and, and software development for over 20 years, I've been in um, compliance for a lot less, but when I joined Odyssey, I kind of thought, well, all the stuff that we're talking about, we're doing in a different form already. So yes. it's it's really about 
reassuring users that you're you have the right processes in place you've got the right controls in place you take the right and again it could be a risk-based approach where you're saying look you know we know this feature is critical to our users we do additional testing on that um so it, it's about reassuring your users regardless of industry that your software does what it's meant to do yeah yeah Exactly. So, and I think that's that's the kind of one of the key messages we are, have here. Look, in order for cloud adoption to be successful in life sciences, there's nothing really to feel extra pressures for, pressures on. You you know you should be good. There should be good practices in place as you're developing SaaS software, and you really just need to um, demonstrate it, provide the evidence, uh, and be able to you know follow it follow it all the way through. And I think that's one of the messages. And now we have guidelines supporting it. So yeah, Finan, go ahead. Yeah, just one of the one of the things that to add to Mark's last response yeah. and that one is saying would it be benefit to other industries. One of the things that we're doing in compliant DevOps is to go that little extra bit to make the evidence kind of human readable or oh, more yeah. digestible by the ordinary man, such as me. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's always a benefit if you went to somewhere else that you can, yes. you know, demonstrate quite clearly in in you know in human speak that you know this is a very compliant process and it works well whereas traditional devops mightn't be as easily to show that yes compliant devops is better at that so it it's, makes your product uh, evidently more better you know yeah or better sorry yeah that's a very important point so the translation if you like yeah. from you know yeah. what the, the devops into as you said uh human readable format or inter so it be interpreted by the people that need to need to see the evidence so um yeah so i think that that's the last of the questions that came came through um it's a we think there's one i think there's oh, one more uh, is there the open uh, yeah there's an open question there i think uh, can see can you see that uh okay let me let me read that one out then sorry i missed missed that or maybe it's gone through so um so one thing that I'm noticing in the narratives is that the cross-functional teams are being treated as separate cells or their own bubble instead of a scrum team that actually works together as one to deliver the product. Could you say a bit more about how the interaction between uh, between the involved teams? How is, uh, sorry, how is yeah. the interaction between the involved teams? I guess in one sense, we're not overly prescriptive in how you do that. And I think that, you know, having... QA and a scrum team makes a lot of sense in a lot of cases, but it's it's right. really um, and maybe it ties back to an earlier question where we talked about merging roles. I think it's important that there is independence um, and oversight, but okay, it it's I guess in, in much the same way. If you take a scrum team, you're going to have a product owner in there, you're going to have testers in there, you're going to have developers in there. So it's already a multidisciplinary team. So it it can make sense to bring quality in there as well. Um, particularly when you go back to the comment that was made by, by Raphael about having um, the kind of risk assessment up front as part of the, the, the kind of backlog grooming and all that. that yeah. Yeah. That, that, that seems to make a lot of sense. Maybe you bring quality in there, but it, it's, it's, again, it's an individual thing. It, it depends on the company, depend, depends on um, okay. what the company needs, because there will be cases where maybe you've got, an awful lot of software development teams and a very small quality team or compliance team. So you can't have yeah. one person per team. So it just, I think it just depends, but yeah, it, it, there's absolutely no issue with doing it that way. Uh, it's not something that we get overly prescriptive about. Um, from our own perspective, um, it kind of makes sense to us to keep it separate because we want to, given that compliance is our core business. We want to make sure that we can kind of stand over everything that we do. And, and yeah. it's, it's nice to have it separate and independent of the development process, but absolutely it can work, yeah. yeah. Great, great. Thanks, Mark. And great questions. So thank you very much. And actually great questions all, all the way through here to the session. So thanks to everybody that, that provided them. So I think, yeah, we'll probably wrap up today's session. It was a short but sweet session this time compared to maybe some of the other sessions. Um, I suppose, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank very much Finan and Mark for contributing today and I really appreciate it. And um, obviously, to thank everybody, our audience, for, for listening. And uh, if we if you have additional questions, maybe after the session, absolutely do not hesitate to reach out directly to us. Um, we can answer those after the event. Um, please go to odysseyvc.com and you, you know enter in contact us and please put your questions to us. We'd be happy, happy to answer them. Um, 
So I think that's a wrap, as they say, for, for 2022. So uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to, to thank all our contributors uh, throughout the four sessions that we had this year uh, and throughout the entire uh, series. And of course, to, to thank the audience and the interest. What we do see is that there are great interests in this topic in our industry and great questions that came through throughout the whole series. Uh, and we're very appreciative of that and, and grateful for people taking time out to, to join us. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully the people who did have gained some valuable insights and uh, on this whole topic. So we're very passionate about this topic here uh, in Odyssey VC. I think that might ha- have come across across the series. Um, and we see it ultimately as just offering a huge benefit to our industry, the life sciences industry. Um, so we're going to keep, keep at it. So until next year. Um, so thank you very much to everybody. Cheers.